All right. Um, so thanks for the intro, Mung. Um, my name is Errol Lido. Um, I actually took this class in 2004, I guess the predecessor to this class. I think it, there were like five people in the class, so it's great to see that it's grown over time. Um, it's really a pleasure to come back here every year and talk to you guys. Um, I actually worked in finance before this and spoke about what I did then, and then have since moved on to online advertising. Um, so there are a lot of cool problems um, in online advertising. And today I just want to back up and sort of tell you guys the, the story of how all this evolved. Um, it's really easy to look at you know, a textbook and see a really elegant theory that's been laid down. But, um, but the truth is, most of, this, most of how online advertising came to use auctions um, was actually very organic, um, sort of evolved naturally over time. Um, so I think to understand it, you really have to flash back to 1994. <laughs> I realize for the first time that many of you in this class may not actually remember 1994. But, um, but as, as hard as it is to believe, in 1994, people really didn't know what the internet was. Um, it was just starting to enter the public consciousness. And people thought of online, they really thought of America online. Like you'd sign on, you'd check your email, their chat rooms. Um, it was really cool back in the day. Um, and people were just starting to hear about, about the World Wide Web. Um, companies were just starting to build websites. Um, and most importantly, 1994 was the year that online advertising was invented. Um, so this was the first online ad ever shown, actually. It was probably the most deceptive ad ever shown. Um, it literally says, if you can't read it, have you ever clicked your mouse here? <laughs> and it was, um, <laughs> It was an AT&T ad, as hard as I just believe, um, and it did pretty well. Like, like most people had no idea what this was. Um, seven out of ten people clicked on it, which by today's standards is really, really good. Um, it's, you're really lucky today if you get one out of every thousand people to click on an ad. So this was a very successful ad. And this really was the birth of a new industry. Um, it's now, you know, $40 billion a year industry, as hard as I believe. Back, back then, in the early 90s, um, you know, how you got an ad on a website was a very simplistic model. Um, you literally picked up a telephone and you called up the website or sales team at a website. And you said, I want to put my ad here. And you ha haggle a little bit over price um, and you basically arrive at some CPM, a cost per thousand impression value that you're willing to pay and your ad would go up for a certain amount of time. There wasn't a lot of sophistication to it. Um, you know, it'd be really interesting to see the equations for this because <laughs> It was very simple, just haggle over price and decide. Um, so much, not much actually changed um, until sort of late 90s. And I think this was the first revolution in online advertising. Um, this was the year that Britney Spears became famous. I don't know if you guys remember that. Do you guys remember like Britney Spears came out with Baby One More Time? Um, it was also the height of the dot-com bubble. Um, Pets.com somehow raised $83 million <laughs> without business model. It was amazing. Um, and it was also the year that um, Idea Lab, which is like the Y Combinator of its day, um, launched a company called GoTo.com. Um, here's the homepage of GoTo.com. Um, it actually looks pretty similar, you know, despite the ugly logo here, it looks pretty similar to Google. Um, and their, their model, their business model is actually very similar as well. Um, they set out to disrupt the, the classifieds industry. Um, so their, their business model was that they built a search engine. Actually, they licensed the search technology from Inktomi. Um, they'd allow people to search for whatever they were looking for. And they'd allow advertisers to pay to have their advertisements actually interspersed with the actual search results. Um, it would be like you know, getting a Google search, except the ads. You can't tell what's an ad and what's an actual search result. Um, and this model actually took off. Like, for a while, people didn't really know um, whether GoTo would be the big search engine of the future or Google. Um, so it was actually a fairly successful business. And here's how they sold their ad spots. Um, so they, they built a self-service platform, and advertisers could log in, and they could put in a bid value, an amount that they were willing to pay per click. Um, and whoever bid the highest per click got placed up higher in the search results. Now, I think somebody over here asked a really good question about why that actually matters. Like, why is it better to be placed up higher? Well, here it matters a lot. You know, if you're, because people generally assume subconsciously that whatever comes up first is the, more rel the most relevant search result. So if you couldn't tell what was a search result and what was an ad, then whoever was at the very top got all the clicks. Um, 
But, but their model was, was very simplistic. Um, it was not a second price auction. Um, whoever bid the highest per click got placed highest in the search results. And this had some serious issues with it. So the biggest issue was that buyers figured out that they could game the system. Um, so they would log in and people figured out, you know, what, what actually happens if I lower my bid? Could I get this, the same placement? And, you know, if the top buyer actually values, you know, a click at $5, in this case, they can actually shade their bid. They can lower their bid to $4 in the penny and they can still get the top spot. So what happened was literally buyers would log in and they would change their bid thousands of times per day. And this wreaked havoc on GoTo's infrastructure. It was very, very like, difficult for them to maintain this auction system. And as a result, they also made less money. Over time, everybody shaded their bid. There's a lot of variation in it, but over time, prices were actually lower than on Google, which we'll talk about. So fast forward to 2000, 2001. Um, so a new company came along called Google. Which, you know, I see a Google shirt over here. So <laughs> I guess people have heard of it. Um, and I think it was actually in 2001 that they launched their self-serve AdWords product. Um, and this really changed everything. Um, you know, not only did Google have the best search engine out there, but they really innovated the way that ad space was sold. Um, so they had two major innovations, and both of these were completely organic. Um, they, they weren't based on theory. Nobody read a textbook. Um, according to In the Plex, like book about Google, it was actually just the engineer working on this had these two absolutely brilliant ideas. So the first was um, he implemented the auction as a second price auction, generally a second price auction. And as you guys know, I mean, what this means is whoever bids the highest actually pays what the second highest bidder bid. So in this case, if the top buyer, if the top bidder bids five dollars per click, and the second highest bidder bids three dollars per click, then the top bidder wins the top spot, but only pays three dollars. So this incentivizes by, incentivizes advertisers to actually bid their fair value. So in this case, if the top bidder bids four dollars, they're still going to pay three dollars. If they bid five dollars, they still pay three dollars. So they might as well bid their fair value. So you don't see the same effect of what happened at GoTo.com where everybody would play around with their bids constantly and eventually it, it resulted in much lower bids. And the second major innovation, which actually seems very simple in retrospect, it's hard to believe that nobody else is thinking about this, um, was that Google tied valuation to click-through rate. Um, what this means is that they you know, very smartly realized that just because somebody bids more per click doesn't necessarily mean that Google is going to make more revenue or effectively more profit off of that. So if the top bidder here is willing to pay $5 per click, and the second guy is willing to pay $3 per click, but the top, buyer get, top bidder gets one click every hour, and the second bidder gets two clicks every hour, Google is going to make $6 by putting the, the second hire's bidder's um, bid up top versus $5. So this results in a very different ranking of of how, how ads are actually shown on page. Um, and as a result, it maximizes revenue for the seller. Um, you know, Google made a lot more money this way. Um, it's actually kind of shocking to believe. So goto.com was later renamed as Overture um, and sold to Yahoo for about $2 billion. Um, and Yahoo, for as long as they were running their own search engine, actually used a first, basically a first price auction model um, and didn't factor in actual click-through rate into their, to their valuation. Um, so um, a lot has been, a lot of academic research has been done on Google's auction model. Um, and people have, you know, rightfully discovered that it has a few inefficiencies in it. Um, so one of the, the biggest things, and by the way, it's worth noting that Google doesn't actually use a pure generalized second price auction anymore. Um, there's a lot more that goes into it. So this is a bit of an oversimplification. Um, but, but one of the, the big issues with generalized second price auctions in general is what happens if a bidder values two of the same goods, or two ad spots in this case, at effectively the same value. So what if I'm a bidder and I realize that I get about the same click-through rate if I'm in the first placement or the second placement. So in this case I get one click every 60 minutes if I'm up at the very top, um, but I get about the same, one click every 61 minutes if I'm in the second highest position. Um, 
So in this case, if, if I value a click at $5 and the second highest bidder values a click at $3, why would I pay $5 to get a click? Why wouldn't I pay $2.99, just below the second bidder? In that case, I'm going to pay a heck of a lot less for something that's worth just about the same amount to me, because as an advertiser, I really care about how often people are clicking on my ads. So this creates an issue. Um, there's a lot of you know, research into how to actually solve this problem, but as we just learned, um, Vickery Clark Groves, or VCG, is sort of the canonically right way to solve this. Um, I'm not going to go into a lot of depth about it. It actually gets kind of complicated. But the basic idea is this. Um, so we have two bidders, and we're auctioning off essentially two goods. So this is why I'm not in academia. Um, I think in terms of apples and oranges, <laughs> not equations. But, but here is a very simple example. We have an apple and orange. We're auctioning off both the apple and the orange. We have two bidders. So bidder A says, I'll pay $10 for the apple, but $9 for the orange. I value them you know, roughly the same. And bidder B says, I'll pay $9 for the apple and $8 for the orange. So in this case, you know, bidder A could just pay, like, bid $7, get roughly equivalent value for, for the orange. But here's how to solve the problem. So in Victory Clark Groves, VCG, um, the, bidder actually pay, the winning bidder actually pays the amount of harm they cause to the second highest bidder. So in this case, if bidder A wins the apple, because they've been bid $10, they value at $10, um, they effectively cause a dollar of harm to the second bidder, because the second bidder now has to live with this orange. And they're willing to value the apple, they, they would value the apple at $9. So they're effectively living with $1 less of value that they could have had. So by, by charging bidder A just $1, there's no incentive for, for bidder A to actually bid less purposely to get a worse good, but something that's roughly equivalent in value. Um, so again, this, this actually gets kind of complicated. I won't go into it much. Um, in practice, it's worth noting that not too many people actually use um, VCG. Um, the, the reason being is that sellers actually make less money. Um, and it's also uh, very difficult to explain to buyers, especially if you're running a self-service ad platform. Um, explaining something like VCG, which is very complicated, is just too difficult. So Google makes more money by not using VCG, and it's easier to explain to buyers. Um, it's also more computationally difficult to, to implement. Um, so fast forward to current day. So Google has obviously been very success successful with their ad model. They, they're on track to make about $40 billion in revenue off of advertising. Um, Facebook is basically the new AOL. They, you know, a third of all page views on the internet are through Facebook now. Um, but shockingly, most internet ads are actually shown in a very inefficient way. Remember that first slide I showed where somebody picks up the phone and calls up a website? That's effectively what happens for about 70% of all the money spent on banner advertising. It's banners that you see. Um, literally somebody at an agency picks up a phone and calls up an ad network or a website and says, you know, I'll pay you this much to show you my ad. Gets a little bit more sophisticated, but, but that's basically the general gist of it. Um, it's actually shocking that this is the case. You know, 2012, we have all this really sophisticated technology, and yet most, most online advertising is still done by somebody haggling over a phone. Um, so AppNexus was founded in 2007, um, we're based in New York City. And we're basically trying to solve this problem. So what we do is we, we replace that phone with an auction mechanism. We feel that this is more efficient at, at serving the right ad to the right user. What we do is, is we every time a user goes to a website, that site makes a request to our servers. And it says, AppNexus, go run an auction and figure out which ad we should show here. Then we reach out, we make a request to thousands of different advertisers, all within about 10 milliseconds. Um, and we say, you know, Amazon, how much are you willing to pay based on what you know about this user? eBay, how much are you willing to pay? We get bids back from all these different bidders. And keep in mind, that they're all bidding based on what they know about the user. So if you recently bought something from eBay, eBay might say, oop, this user has a higher propensity to buy, so we're going to bid more on them. So everybody returns their bids, we select the highest bidder. So this re basically replaces the phone. It's like real-time programmatic haggling, essentially. Um, and you know, just like Google and AdWords, we use a second price auction as well. So very simple example. You guys bidding two cents, Groupon bids a penny. 
eBay would win, they'd get to show their ad, but they'd only pay a penny. Now, in some sense, this is a much simpler problem than Google has. Um, we're not auctioning off multiple ad spots on a page. We're auctioning off essentially one at a time. By the way, we do this 30 billion times a day. So we run a lot of auctions. <laughs> um, but there's a lot of hidden complexity to this. Um, specifically, I mean, we've noticed some major inefficiencies with the second price auction. So here's, here's a good example of one. So, um, so in banner advertising, how many times at what frequency you show your ad to, to user makes a lot of difference for an advertiser. So if I'm Ford and I show you an ad once, you know, that ad is probably going to be somewhat effective. I show it to you a second time, you've already seen the ad, so it's going to be a little bit less effective, especially if I show it to you like, you know, one right after the other. If I show you my ad 100 times, you're probably going to get annoyed. That might actually have negative value to me. So naturally, bidders tend to bid less after they've shown a the user their ad. So, that, so the first time you know, Ford sees a user, they might bid $5. The second time, they'll bid $2.50. Third time, might bid $1.25, and so on. They're going to keep decreasing their bid, you know, usually some exponential function over time. Um, so I modeled this out here. Here's a very simple example of this happening. Um, so here we have Ford, AT&T, and Kraft. And this is the number of times they've seen the same user over and over again. So the first time, they all see a user. Ford bids $5, AT&T bids $3, and Kraft bids $2. And so Ford's going to win that auction. They bid the most, and they're going to pay the second price, which is what AT&T bid, $3. And the second time everybody sees, um, sees that user, so notice now Ford is bidding less. They're only bidding $2.50 because they've already shown that to their user, to that user, so the user is less valuable to them. AT&T now has the highest bid. AT&T is still bidding $3 because they haven't had a chance to show that ad to the user yet. Um, and Kraft bids $2. So AT&T is going to win that auction and it's going to pay $2.50, the second highest price. And so on and so forth. Um, so eventually, you know, the price naturally goes down the more frequently you see a user because everybody's had a chance to show their ads to that user. So in this case, you know, the average bid price is $1.29 and the seller is making about 13 bucks in total. Now, what happens if Ford, you know, the highest bidder in this case, says, um, you know, we're going to try something a little bit different. For the first five times we see this user, we're not going to submit a bid. We're not going to bid at all. And the sixth time we see the user, we're going to start bidding then. But we're actually going to start bidding much less. So what, what happens? Um, so in this case, we're still running a second price auction. But here, you know, Ford isn't bidding for the first five auctions. In the first auction, AT&T bids $3, Kraft bids $2. Kraft ends up paying $2, right? Less than what, what they would have made um, in the previous case, and so on and so forth, until the sixth time that we see that user. This time, Ford bids, and they bid $3, but because AT&T and Kraft, the other two advertisers, have already shown users their ads so many times, they're now bidding at $0.33. Cents. So Ford wins the auction because they bid $3, by a way, less than they would have paid before, but they're only paying 33 cents now. Whereas they paid $3 before, they're only paying a tenth of that now. It's kind of crazy. So now, all of a sudden, the average price, the average bid price goes down to 33 cents, and the seller only makes $7, almost half of what they made before. Yeah? Doesn't this strategy in which they uh, bid over and over and over again hurt for and what you said, the annoying of the user if you have the, uh, the ad show up multiple times? Um, so, so, so you're saying, isn't it, so it's less valuable the second time you show an ad to user? Yeah, yeah so, so the answer is, buyers will, advertisers will typically bid to show the user an ad a second time. They'll just bid less, because as you say, I mean, it's less valuable. Yeah. Um, in, in some cases, there's a lot of very sophisticated stuff that goes on, so they may not bid at all. They may say, it's just not worth it for us to show an ad the second time, or we're going to show our ads to the user every other time, or something like that. This is a very simple example of it. Uh, yeah? Yeah, so as your bid density increases, um, you have this problem much less. But it also depends on 
So when you take into account what people know, what bit different bidders know about a user, then it becomes very different. Because on any given auction, you may have, let's say, you know, Ford, AT&T, and Kraft, and 100 other bidders may be participating. But Ford, AT&T, and Kraft may be the only advertisers that know something about that user. So Ford may know that you've been to their website recently. You know, Kraft may know that you recently bought their bought Oreos or something. And AT&T may know that you're currently a Verizon subscriber. So because they know these things, they're all kind of bidding on a separate good. They're, they're actually bidding much more than everybody else. So all of a sudden you have this situation where you're, you basically you know, have a much lower bid density at a much higher price point. And this actually happens quite a bit. Yeah? As a bidder, how am I choosing which sites I would want my banners to go on to? Like which sites I'd be bidding for? Yeah, so that's an excellent question. Um, so there's actually, so uh, there's a lot of thought that goes into this. Um, typically, you use sort of a, an optimization process. So over time, you, you basically run, run your ads everywhere or where you think that they're going to work. And then you look at what sites are actually working. So where you get the most clicks or where people sign up for AT&T subscriptions. And over time, you start to spend your money um, in more con like more concentrated way just on those sites. It's a very simplistic way of doing it, but there's, it actually gets pretty complex how you do that optimization. Uh, sorry, you had a question before. Yeah, well, I mean, just to demonstrate that they could actually bid less than their fair value and still why win the... Why would they want to do this? Why would they want to in this case? Yeah. It doesn't actually make a difference in this case. But I'm just pointing out that there's no... They, there's nothing preventing them from not telling the truth in this case. Um, yeah? If you have a small number of bidders, couldn't the bidders just, like, collaborate and say, you're going to bid cents, I'm going to bid one cent, and we're going to take turns. Yeah, collusion. Um, it's a big problem. <laughs> okay. Do you have, like, is there, like, a, like, an algorithmic way to get around that, or do you just have to, like, have terms of service and lawyers? I mean, you, you, can, you can look for patterns. So you can actually, you know, look to see what the average price of an ad placement is, for instance, and who's bidding on it. Um, and if you see sudden drops in the price, or, you know, the price tends to trends down over time, then you can kind of figure out what's going on. But it's actually very difficult to, to figure out in practice, and it does happen. Um, there, there are all sorts of other tricks that, that bidders use. So another one is uh, called bid stuffing. So, they'll, if, so each of these buyers probably has an, a budget, an amount of money that they're willing to spend to show ads. So in this case, if AT&T knows that Ford's budget is $100, let's say, they could bid purposely higher to get Ford to spend more money and um, to spend out their budget faster so that all of a sudden AT&T can start winning at a lower price. Yeah? There's another answer to the previous question. You can have like a minimum bid and minimum like, separation between the bids to discourage companies from doing that. Even if they did know each other, they can't influence like, the website when they get to the Yeah. Um, right, so that, that's one, one methodology for doing that. There's been, there's, I've read some papers on like random end price auctions. So there's some, some theory, I don't think it's actually been tried very well in practice, but um, what, what would happen if you actually ran a third price auction or a fourth price auction? And what happens if the buyers actually don't know which level they're being price reduced down to? Then it significantly changes the dy dynamics and actually disincentivizes things like collusion. Um, yeah? In this case, does each buyer Um, in this case, they don't. Yep. What about a system where once people drop out of the auction or out of the auction for the entire cycle? Once people drop out of it? Yeah, so like... With so, so you work, can never bid on that user again? Yeah. That, well, that's, you can never bid on that user, but you can never bid in maybe this specific time bracket. Like you can't bid for the next five minutes or yeah, exactly. hour so or something. Yeah, exactly. drop them from the auction. It's, it's an interesting idea. It's an interesting idea. Um, I don't know. I mean, that, that would also potentially be damaging to sellers. Sellers might make less money because it, it decreases bid density on subsequent bids. Um, but, it, but it's an interesting idea, potentially we're trying. Um, here, so here's what sellers typically do 
um, to prevent against this type of practice. Um, so, so the best defense that they have today um, is called price floors. This is the equivalent of, of using a reserve price on eBay. So sellers generally know, you know what their ad placements are worth to buyers. They, they know roughly. So what they do is they say, um, you know, we're not going to allow buyers to buy our ad placement for under this dollar value. So in this case, um, taking the exact same, uh, exact same example as before, but simulate it with a $1.25 price floor. So what happens? So in this case, we run the first five auctions. You know, AT&T, Craft Bid. You notice that on auctions four and five, the seller actually chooses not to show an ad at all. So they don't accept anybody's bid um, because they, they know that they're probably not getting a fair value for, for their inventory. On the sixth auction, you know, Ford comes in um, and they're going to get price reduced, but they're actually going to get price reduced down to the value of that price floor. So the seller says, you know, I'll sell, I'll sell my ad placement, but for no less than $1.25. So in this case, we're not price reducing down to the second bid, we're price reducing down to the value of the price floor. So Ford actually pays $1.25. On the seventh bid, they're also going to pay $1.25. So here, the, the seller actually ends up making a little bit more money than they made before. So the seller made about $7 before, now they're making $7.25. So the sellers actually increase their revenue by putting in these price floors and actually not showing, bid, not showing ads on some bids. Um, but this also gets to be a very risky game for sellers. Because what happens if you set a price floor too high or too low? So here's a, the same example, but with a $1.50 price floor on the right-hand side. So see what happens here is that the seller chooses not to show an ad more often. They, um, you know, Ford is going to pay more when they actually win, but the seller actually makes less money than they would have made if they had no price floors. So if they made $7 before, now they're only making about $6.50. So this ends up being a pretty complicated game that buyers and sellers play. This actually happens in real life. Like, I'm not actually, you know, it's not just theory, it actually happens. So here's an example, it's real data. I can't tell you which website this is, but, <laughs> but, but I promise you these are two different websites here. On the top, so on the y-axis on both these charts is the win rate. So this is how often buyers are winning as a function of how much they're bidding. So on the, the top chart here, we see that it's you know, roughly linear. It's basically what we'd expect. If buyers um, bid at a higher price, they'll win more often. But on the slower chart here, you see some interesting behavior. So buyers never win if they bid less than 90 cents, meaning the, s the seller here has probably put in a price floor at 90 cents. So nobody can, nobody can win my ad placement if they pay less than 90 cents. What happens is, okay, well after 90 cents, you know, everybody's bidding just around 90 cents and is winning. So in, in this case, the, the seller's probably put in a price floor that's actually too, um, too high because everybody's winning after 90 cents. So there's, no there's not a, a linear distribution of bids after that 90 cent price floor. Um, so this ends up being a pretty complicated game that um, we deal with every day at AppNexus.